markets. Yes. Okay. So, um, Marcus, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us today. So, Marcus Arantibia is um, he's passionate about big data, machine learning, AI, and um, he's a product manager at Oracle. Um, yeah, we're, we're littered with those today. Um, so, but it's it's nice to have you here. Um, and uh, he's he's worked in uh, in many um, if you like capacities, but. Uh, in the SAS Institute um, for 13 years as a data mining architect. Um, so he's he's an interesting guy, even to, before he starts to open his mouth. Um, I think one of the things that was it, 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 his his fun fact, if you like, is that he collects headphones and record players. Now, I mean, I think I do that but by accident. <laughs> as someone who does it on purpose, I'd be quite interested in. Anyway, so with that, um, uh, Marcos, uh, welcome, and uh, let me hand it over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure being here with you guys. Um, hopefully, you guys have, tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, thank you for joining, guys. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about you have a machine learning model. Now what, right? What to do when um, you have a, a machine learning? So it's basically streamlining the process from when you have a model all the way to pushing the model and working with Oracle Machine Learning and Autonomous Database, right? So I'm um, um, basically, I'm going to talk about a few components. Uh, you know, a quick overview. I think you guys already had that. Um, then I'm going to be talking about uh, deploying the model. So PL SQL to SQL scoring, uh, building the model with Python, and then scoring it with SQL and vice versa. Then we're going to check OML, um, AutoML UI uh, in terms of the scoring, right? So how does the one deploy the model from there? And then uh, auto generation of notebooks as well, which is another way of uh, deploying the model. And finally, we're going to take a look at a quick demo on OML services and how to uh, use that right to work with it. So um, OML, I think very quickly, you guys have already seen this, right? So these are the different components we have for Oracle Machine Learning. So basically at the end of the day, we have several ways to build models, right? So the different languages and different capabilities. And then we have uh, different interfaces that we can use. But then we also have uh, the no code interface or so no code way of doing those things. And then we can do the model deployment, right? We're using OML services. So, so we're going to focus more on the deployment uh, on this session, right? Um, uh, again, the three key pillars, right, for us has always been automation, the uh, capability of, of running a, a scalable, right, uh, and performing environment, but also the deployment, right? The deployment, I think, is the one of the key things. Uh, many, many, uh, many people, many studies have been done about. Um, the abilities to get a project and make that successful. And um, more often than not, uh, the basic reason why a model is more successful than the others is that the model can be deployed easily and fast, right? So data scientists are producing their models and then there uh, is a uh, people uh, in app development and IT working for those models and getting them, right? So they're able to do that. So, um, these are some of the models, right? So when we think about uh, models, these are the algorithms that uh, Oracle Machine Learning includes. So you can easily see that there's a, a wide range of, of algorithms for all kinds of different uh, things that you wanna do. Uh, but then all of them actually generate the model object, right? So these guys generate a model object inside the Oracle database that can be explored, that can be uh, evaluated, and that can be deployed. So that's basically what we're gonna do um, today. So I'm not gonna go into details about all of these models, but I'm definitely gonna talk about a couple of these guys and we're gonna show you how to uh, deploy them, right? So um, model deployment and scoring with OML, right? So um, how do we actually build uh, PL SQL models and score with SQL? So to give you an illustration of how the process is working, right? So um, an idea of how the process works. So this picture should give you an idea of that, right? So that um, shows you at the left, you have an analytical base table, right? So basically that's the input data set, right? So that's the table that was prepared and worked 
between the data scientist and the data engineer, right? And the and people in IT. So there's always this wrangling that happens, right? So until you get your data right. So what I'm assuming is you have worked on your data, you have, you know, created the, the columns that you need, right? The target that you need, for example, and then you're now in SQL working against that, that data and that data is on a, on a table, right? So for that, uh, basically what we're going to do is then the data scientist is going to work with um, SQL and um, uh, the point that of the integration between the data scientist and the application developer is going to be then that once that uh, model is built, the actual model is ready to roll. Um, in uh, Oracle Machine Learning, when you build a model, it is already part of the database. It can be accessed by uh, any SQL, right? Any SQL code can come in and a JDBC call. So the application developer can use any JDBC call against the Oracle database, right? Any type of integration from within his uh, application, uh, Apex, and then he can work with Oracle uh, Analytics Cloud as well. So the folks in the, in the business intelligence side can create a dashboard that actually can take advantage of the in-database um, models as well, right? Because they can go in and then get uh, a scoring of that model, right? So that is a, a very easy uh, a process to build, right? Then uh, in the other portions of that then is uh, the code. So the code itself on the left-hand side, you have the model build, right? So we're building uh, the machine learning model here. And basically you're gonna notice that at the top, I'm first things first, I'm deleting the model. So I'm dropping a model with that name in red to make sure that no other model exists in the database with that name. Right. So then I'm declaring that and that is a data mining model. And then I build that model. Right. So I have my function there, create model two. And as soon as I say that name in quotes there in red, Pratt Affinity DT, that's basically what I'm calling that model. Right. That's going to be the name of that model for the database. So I'm creating here a decision tree pretty much with the default settings. Uh, and I'm building that and on top of a supplementary demographics table, and then I'm using you know, my, my affinity card as my target, right? So with that, I'm basically trying to um, identify whether or not a customer is gonna buy that product and, or accept an offer. And um, once that model is built on the left, on the right-hand side, you see what the magic of the Oracle SQL does, right? So Oracle SQL has the special prediction underscore probability functions that allow you to score immediately the model that you created on the left. So on the right, all I need to do is either prediction or score probability. I can use prediction, just prediction directly to get the yes or no, right? And then with the prediction probability there, I'm gonna say, I would like to get a prediction affinity DT for one, right? For the case when that is one, that is a yes. Uh, and then at that point, I get that probability run. So as you can imagine, you can run that exact same code from any interface, right? So you can run it on from your application. So the data scientist is building the models on the left and the application developer is writing those uh, that code on the right. right? Um, so as long as that model name stays the same in your code and in the application development, everyone is happy, right? So the model name is the important piece here that is connecting those two worlds. Um, but the important thing is, the model always is in the database, right? So the database builds this and it's there already registered, ready to go, right? So when we uh, work with models then, basically what we do is we uh, try to make it easier for the data scientists, right? Because we're writing a lot of code uh, and sometimes we need to document things and document steps and, and work together. And not only that, work with SQL and Python at the same time, for example, right? So the Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks then brings those two things together, right? It brings the ability to write SQL code and PL SQL code and the ability to write Python code, all of that in one single notebook where you can exchange and, and switch back and forth between languages so that you can understand how one, one person is gonna look at that, right, versus the other. But not only that, you can actually use then functionality that is not available in SQL, for example, the graphs, right, the graphics, nice graphics that are available from 
uh, a Python library, right? Python packages like uh, matplotlib, for example. So you can build your models and, and work with that in, in SQL, but then switch back and uh, to Python <clears throat> and then work with that in a graphical way. So that's basically a, a great in, you know, um, platform, right, for collaboration. Um, so in there, we have model building with PL SQL and we have the scoring with Python, right? So at that point, um, for Python, what we have done, and I, probably you guys have already seen this, uh, the machine learning for Python, both machine learning for Python and R, uh, basically use the database as an HPC environment, right? So we're taking advantage of the database parallelism, capabilities, the power, also spawning different sessions behind the scenes. So you can spawn multiple uh, Python sessions, multiple R sessions. And in Autonomous in particular, we have uh, the AutoML UI, right? Which is actually built on top of OML for Pi's AutoML, which is also included in on-premises and the MLX. That's part of the model explainability capabilities, right? So we have all of the tools that allow you to build models uh, and then tools that help the data scientists build models better, right? Um, so um, with that, then, when we're working with uh, different types of models, then we, we actually have uh, those capabilities uh, to show the data scientist in this kind of environment. So for example, I can be using OML notebooks, and as we talked about before, I can use SQL and Python. And with that, you know, I can access an analytical base table. So now I'm a data scientist, I'm working with both languages, but still the models still are the same, right? So the application developer can still come to me using SQL, uh, the Oracle Analytics Cloud still will be able to find those models in database as long as I register them with the model, with a model name, right, that, that we're going to see. So uh, how does that work? So on the left now, I'm creating a model uh, with uh, PL SQL, right? So it's the same model that I just did, right? I'm deleting that model on top, and I'm building uh, the prediction um, uh, affinity DT, right? So the decision tree. And on the right-hand side now, instead of using SQL, I'm using Python. So for using Python, and there are a few things that I need to do, right? So I need to load and import the OML package. So that's the first line there. Then the second line, I'm actually just synchronizing a proxy object to an Oracle database table, okay? So that means that I'm not pulling the data into the Python's memory. I'm just telling Python, hey, use this proxy object as if it was an pandas data frame, right? But I'm just pointing to, right, the SQL code that is my table in the, in, you know, in the back. So then uh, the third line, uh, and I think that's one of the most important ones here, is I am declaring a decision tree model. So normally you would say, I'm building a, a decision tree model, right? And then I'm gonna do a fit. But in this case, remember, we are scoring and the model was already built, right? So the model was already built by SQL and it's there in database. With this code, when I say oml.dt and I open parentheses and give the model a name, what I'm saying here is that I wanna use that model. So please load that model that exists already in database with that name, right? Into this model object now. So what's going to happen here is I'm not building a model again, right? The model is built. All I'm doing again is pointing to that model, right? So now Python, right? We're using OML for Pi capabilities is going to say, oh, you have that model already. So let me just point to it so that I can predict, I can score, right? And then in the next line, I'm doing a predict. And in this case, predict underscore proba as well. So you can do predict or predict underscore proba. And, um, that's basically it. So I'm doing the prediction immediately, pointing to a, a, that table, the proxy that I created, and then telling it what are the supplemental columns that I would like to see. Those are features that we uh, added um, to our prediction, right? So all of our prediction uh, can actually have the supplemental columns so that when the prediction comes out, it doesn't come just one single vector, right, of predicted values you really want to find out who, what customer that refers to, right? 
and you don't want to rely on on any random you know ordering right that might happen in the middle so you want to say i need a customer id and then i want my uh, prediction next to it right and you can add many other columns as well so all depends on application developers right sometimes the application developer would like to receive back maybe three four columns right um so that's something that you can uh, actually give them right away right? so that's basically uh, the process here so we're doing that scoring on a model that was already existing or pre-existing built by someone else uh, by the way that model did not have to be built by PL SQL. You could also have used OML, AutoML UI, right, to build it. And then it would still be found here. And we're gonna take a look at that later. So again, the critical, critical thing here is the model name. Okay. So always remember that's the probably the most critical thing you guys are gonna see. The model name has to be the same here and there. And, and that connects both languages easily, okay? So moving on, we have uh, the model building with Python and scoring with SQL, right? So that is also uh, something that uh, it's definitely a, a, a much used uh, uh, component, right? That we, we work with. Um, so for that, what we're gonna do is the person that is building the model, right? Is gonna be doing, um, that code on the left right so um in the left then what you have is you have the code for building the model with python right so what we're doing is we have uh, we are loading uh, and importing the uh, oml package again uh, we have an input data set so we're synchronizing right the data with the table and then we are splitting the data into train and test that's you know all data scientists use that all the time so we can do a, a, a dot split there immediately. That's a, a standard pandas right command uh, for data frames uh, for pandas data frames to split. But we support that directly, right, transparently on our OML frame data frame. And then we're splitting that into x and y, right? Then we're we're giving it some settings. We're actually putting um, the random forest as a model there. So now this is a random forest model. We're saying you know these are the settings of that model see that the difference before was when i was doing the oml dt i did not need to put any settings right because the model was already built so all i did was model name in there and that loaded the model this time i'm creating a new object right and i am telling it the settings so that the, the key difference here is now this guy's gonna build the model right in the next line then i'm gonna do a fit right a dot fit of that model now this is critical again, because if you do a dot fit, but you do not use a model underscore name on your fit, that means that this becomes a temporary model. Okay. Remember, because this is important. If you don't put the model name in here, when you're doing a fit of a OML for Pi model and when you're building, it becomes a temporary model, right? So it works perfectly fine and everything is going to work great. Your notebook is going to run from top to bottom. But if anyone tries to use a different uh, environment, a SQL or a different uh, notebook and try to load that model, the model is not going to be there. Okay. So by adding a model underscore name to that fit call, we are actually pushing that model as a permanent in database model. Okay. So now I'm building that, that random forest model and I'm baking that into our in database models. Okay. And that's why on the right hand side, you can pick up that same model with that name. I'm again using Oracle SQL, very simple, simple call, prediction underscore probability. Now I'm using the random forest model that was built using that Python code on the next, uh, on the left. And, and then you get the results from there, okay? So very important again, always remember the model underscore name settings, right? If you're using OML for Pi, uh, that's gonna be important for you. Um, you're not, you might not have to use it because if you're doing things that are gonna be deleted or just testing, uh, right? You, you don't really wanna bake every model you're trying or testing into the database, you don't. 
just remember to do that for the best one or the last one or the one that you really want uh, you know, someone else to be working with and scoring, right? All right, now uh, AutoML UI. Um, so Mark uh, probably talked about it uh, and um, I don't wanna go again to super details on it, but I'm gonna show you a few things that uh, of the way that AutoML UI works on the scoring side, right? And how to deploy those models. So uh, AutoML UI, uh, again, as, as you guys probably have seen, already seen, right? We have the automated algorithm selection, we have adaptive sampling, automated feature selection, automated model tuning, but all of that, the objective of all of that is to get models, right? To get good models. Um, so a, a great models out of, out of there directly, right, by default, and then things that you can probably tweak later, right, and, and, and work with or compare with your own models later, right? So that's basically the objective of AutoML UI. So the interface is, is super user friendly. I think you probably have seen a demo of it already. Very powerful. Uh, and the most important thing for us on the scoring side here is gonna be the leaderboard, right? Because that leaderboard has a lot of very powerful features that we can, uh, we can use. Um, so uh, we also have a, a guide that's called the OML models, right? So that's also an option in our menu on OML uh, in our UI there. And the models is gonna actually show you the current models that were built and are baked into um, the database, but also show you deployments. So the deployments are the ones that are gonna be deployed to OML services. So we're gonna talk about that um, as well. So first things first, um, if you're using AutoML UI, then as a data scientist, right? There are many options that you have, and, and that's why I wanted to cover these different options. Uh, you can, the first thing you could do, for example, would be, you know, uh, the most simple one, right? It would be actually to just rename the model. Uh, and that will go through the bottom part. So if you rename the model, right, it's optional, but it's extremely useful, as you're going to see. Uh, if you rename the model, then what happens is that model is just available, right, to... Uh, the, uh, the application developer and to um, Oracle Analytics Cloud, right? So that's a, a very easy way to get those things uh, connected. Uh, you can also deploy the model. So that's a, a deployment of that in-database model directly to OML services. And then OML services can then be used by the application developer to be uh, you know, calling REST, right? REST endpoints to that. And on the top route, you have uh, a generation of the notebooks. So if you generate a notebook, basically you can rebuild that model. So you run that notebook and then rebuild that model. And now you give it a name there. And then with that model, the new model that you just developed, you then you could use, uh, you know, scoring with SQL, or you could then export that model into OML services as an example. So all of those things, you know, will, at the end of the day, connect right to the, the right-hand side, right to, to what the application developer is going to be capable of doing by putting your model into production, right? So, first set of um, quick example, then, right? The first example we have is we're going to check uh, AutoML UI deployment by model renaming. I think that's the probably the, the easiest one uh, that we're going to see, right? So. In, he, in this example, we're actually going to AutoML. So we're going to open up AutoML and then we're gonna open up um, our experiment. So we click on our experiment that was previously completed. Um, and as you probably have seen, once you have completed the experiment, right, you have the leaderboard. So in the leaderboard in here, what we're gonna see is we're gonna choose the best model by balance accuracy, for example, and we're gonna click on rename. And then we're gonna give it a name. So uh, in this case, we're giving it, um, you know, AutoML RF, just so that we remember where that model came from, right? And that's it. You get a, you know, you get a confirmation, and then we can take a look at that model, right? So that model is has the new name there. So um, let's take a look first if that model is in models, right? So we go into OML models, and now we can confirm that the model is there, right? So we can go in and search, right? The search capability is a great thing. So we can search by for auto. And then we can see that the, the model is there, 
right? So now what we can do is we can actually take that model and run a test, right? So let's test it out. So we can go to our home here and open a scratch pad. And in the scratch pad, basically you can type in whatever. So I'm typing in some SQL code, right? I copy and pasted some simple, simple SQL code there. And now I'm gonna use Oracle SQL prediction and prediction probability with that exact model, right? That model that I just renamed from the AutoML UI. And I'm gonna just run it. So I'm gonna get customer ID, the prediction, the prediction probability, and all the rest of the data from that table, right? And as we're gonna see, you get the will customer buy it or not, right? Yes, if the probability is more than 0.5, right? More than 50%. And then if the probability is lower than 50, then the customer is not gonna buy, right? That's gonna be the recommendation of the, uh, of the system right away, okay? So we can see that that was our quick demo on rename. Very simple, right? Very, very easy to do, right? Now, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna work with the auto generation um, of notebooks, right? So we're gonna generate a notebook from scratch, uh, let the auto ML UI do it, and then we're gonna evaluate the code that it's uh, been uh, built for us, right? So in here, then we're gonna go again, back to our good old auto ML UI, and uh, again, into our um, experiment, right? And as bef you know, same way as before, right? We're gonna see the leaderboard, we're gonna scroll down, but this time we're gonna click uh, on the model and we're gonna click on create notebook. So again, we need to give it a name. So we are gonna give it a, a, a nice name that we can find it you know, later on. And uh, because this environment has a lot of notebooks, you're gonna see, you know, we have a new notebook there. I'm gonna go into OML notebooks now, right? Into the notebook section. And I have a lot of notebooks, so I have to use search to find it easier. Um, and then I find it there. So now I'm gonna open that notebook up. So the first thing we're gonna do when um, OML loads that notebook and shows it to us is I'm gonna run um, everything, right? So to that, for that, I'm gonna click on that button on the top, run all paragraphs, because I just wanna see everything, right? So when I run it, um, I can preview easily, you know, the metadata about the model and who created it when, then I have the proxy, right, of the data. So this is collecting that proxy to the data set and showing it to me. Um, but it's a proxy, right? It doesn't download the data, right? But I, I can see the data there. And then the next step is gonna be a splitting, right? So Python always requires an X and Y. So I need to split that into X and Y. And here now are the settings that the AutoML found to be the most optimal for that random forest setting. So for that model, I'm building that model that uh, the um, AutoML UI understood as being the best. And now I ran it over here and I can see the results. So I can see the quality, I can see global statistics. And because it's on a random forest, I can see the uh, attribute importance, right? So a list of the attributes and their importance in relation to this model, right? What are, how important they are, right? And then I keep going and I can see there's a scoring, right? So basically I'm gonna do scoring on the same input data set and I'm gonna check the, the quality of, right, of that metric, in this case, balance accuracy. And optionally, this is something I added, right, to the notebook myself by hand. Uh, you can add something like this, as simple as that, that will show you all the customer data sets, all the information. And because I said proba equals true in the predict, I got the probability, but this is different. Remember, this is the probability of that prediction. So probability of one means really the guy is not gonna buy it, right? Because it has a one probability for a no, okay? So this is a different uh, type of probability. You have to adjust, uh, and you can get a probability of yes as well if you wanted to. Um, so that's just important so that you guys don't confuse that, right? Those are two different things. Um, all right, so now, from AutoML UI, how can I deploy models to OML services, right? So that's again, a very, very easy process, right? So we're gonna go and uh, we're gonna click on AutoML. Again, go back to our experiment. And um, right here, we're gonna then select our model again. So we're gonna select the random forest model that we had before. And we're now gonna click deploy. So with that deploy, 
basically you have to fill in a basic information. Uh, we're gonna just keep the same model name, but we need to give it a unique URI, a unique version number, and then OML models and say the model we wanna share that, right? And when we do that, basically the model is uh, available, right, in OML services uh, for scoring, right? That's basically what happened. So as easy as that, right? Very simple. Um, now, you can also deploy models to OML services from OML models, right? As we were showing before. So if we go he from here, uh, from our main menu into OML models now, we're gonna see that all of the models that were previously built are there. So as an example, I, if I sort it by date, right, I'm gonna get that support vector machine model at the top that has a random name because it, you know, AutoML gives it a random name, right? So we can select that model and deploy it. And we can improve the name of it so we know, you know, what we were trying to do. So it's a support vector machine linear model trying to predict affinity card, right, in that case. Uh, again, unique URI and then version and the same namespace and, and say the model is shared. So that model is going to be basically uh, deployed, right, successfully. So again, model is uh, available and, and uh, to be scored by uh, OML services, right? So let's verify that the models were deployed, right, uh, into OML services. So you can do it from here as well. If you go to OML models and you go into the deployment section, uh, then basically, you know, uh, a simple sort by date there, deploy date, you're gonna basically see that the top two models are the ones that we just deployed, right? Support vector machine linear model and the prediction, uh, the Pred Affinity Auto RF, right? And if we then click on the URI for our random forest model, we're going to see the entire open API for it. So you actually get the, the URL on how to deploy that model, where to call that model, right? Uh, and then you get the entire information about the input attributes. So you're going to see all the properties, all of the information about the input attributes for the models. Uh, so what do they need as input, right? What kind of uh, types of input data sets they need. But you also see um, the probability, right? So the output uh, of those models, right? What are they going to output for us, right? So uh, that's basically what you can see. So if you use, you know, a user of a curl or something like that, you will see that the models are are there, right? Already. Um, so basically, what we have seen so far then is we deployed models, we had scored models using code, using SQL, and using Python, uh, and now we have saw several different ways of, of doing that from within AutoML UI and OML models. But now from OML models and AutoML UI, we deploy the models directly to OML services, right? So OML services is going to be the interface that allows you to do real-time scoring, right? This is a little bit different than um, your normal uh, uh, coder, right? Because what we're, we're going to be doing here is this guy is expecting a REST call, right? Uh, so uh, in addition to that, OML services is a real-time scoring, right? So we are working on um, introducing a batch scoring for it, right? That's, a, that's a, 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 let's say, a, an upcoming feature that we, we want to make sure that is part of the, of the code. But today, OML services does real-time scoring. So you are going to send a piece of uh, input data sets and attributes, and the OML services server is going to score them in real time, okay? So we expect, you know, millisecond, uh, around 100 milliseconds uh, is an example of a scoring that I've had, for example, from here in Miami, and the server is in Santa Clara, right, in California. So uh, crossing the country, you know, my, my request and then receiving the response uh, after uh, the, the initial call where OML services is actually bringing that model into memory, right? So for caching the model, um, then after the first call, then the other calls are all typically 100 milliseconds and things like that. So again, it's gonna depend on how many attributes you have and all that, but it gives you an idea, right? So for that process then, um, that's what we're gonna uh, show here. So taking advantage of the OML services, and scoring those uh, those models using the REST API interface, right? So 
if you're a data scientist then uh, using uh, that process and you're doing anything, right, as an OML data scientist, you would be accessing those analytical base tables, right, that, that input data set, uh, sets. And then you're going to deploy those models as we have seen so far into OML services. There are options as well to load models in Onyx format. So Onyx is the Open Neural Networks Exchange format, and uh, it's, it's very common, right? Customers uh, use that uh, kind of uh, models a lot. And that's a standard that uh, is also available in OCI Data Science, for example, right? So um, you can export the models in Onyx format uh, as an open source environment as well. And then you can import those models uh, into OMA services and be able to uh, score them in real time uh, as well. So that's what we're going to see. So basically, um, on the left-hand side, you see the typical process, right? So you would need uh, your, uh, basically your uh, URL for your data center, right? So you get that with the open API of the model, as you saw, but you get the IP address, right? Now in here, basically, you're going to get the data center that you're running. So if it's an Ashburn data center, you get something like that. Then we need the model URI. Remember that URI that we gave the models both in OML models and in AutoML UI, we gave them the URI, right, the unique uh, URI. So that's what we need here as well. And then we need to provide a full bearer token. The token then is obtained by using your um, user authentication against autonomous database. So for your user and password that you normally use on autonomous database, that's what you're going to use to get an authentication and then um, get uh, that process uh, available to you, right? On the right, you see an animation, but we're going to, uh, we're going to check out uh, a full on demo on, on OML services directly, right? So that's basically what's happening. So the, when you get that uh, that token, normally that token is valid for uh, for six minutes, and that can be refreshed. Um, we can refresh that token, I think, up to eight times. So you get uh, an idea, right? So the, the the application developer is working with something like a curl. Is going to be working with a Postman application with, uh, you know, VS Code, right? It, it all it all depends on what the, the the application developer is used to working with, but the idea is that no matter what, we can give you that interface and that access, right? So let's take a look at how that looks uh, in um, in Postman, so that um, we can uh, we can uh, see that uh, in action. Okay, so here I'm in uh, in uh, Postman, and um, what I'm doing here is basically um, I am. Uh, let me just um, adjust the font size here a little bit. Okay, so I'm in Postman, and basically what I'm doing here is I'm uh, I'm gonna get um, to begin with, right? I'm gonna get my uh, my user token so that um, I'm gonna get a user token, right? So I mentioned before uh, I'm gonna be you know going against my uh, my data center, right, in San Jose, and um, uh, I'm going to get a user token. I have a specific address for that, right, so you have that initial address for that, uh, for San Jose data center. Uh, type password, right, so I have a username and password for that database, uh, autonomous database. So I just send that, and, and that will give me my uh, my token, right. So I'll, I'll get that, uh, that token is this very long uh, string. And because I have some special tests here, I'm storing that token into a, 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 a string here, right? So now I can actually check that model, the model that we just built, right? That is called pred underscore affinity underscore AutoML underscore RF, right? So for that specific model, then uh, we can just check In this case, we're just going against the model directly. So we're doing a get on that model. That's going to give us the metadata, the description about that model, right? The details. So we can see the details here of that model, right? Version type and model type uh, created by what was the user created? What was the original model name? If you remember, that was the model name we, we created, right? We renamed it to that in AutoML UI. Uh, it was a random forest. And these are the inputs, right? So you had a bunch of input 
attributes that the model can take and then um, the uh, output, the return, is whether a customer is going to buy an insurance or not. Yes, yes and no, right? That's the, the output here, right? And then you have the, the you know, the, the HRAF, right, um, for that model. So that's great. So let's try to score with that model. So you're going to notice that in this string here, there's going to be a quick change, which is now for the scoring, I have to actually I have to add the slash score in front of it, right? And what I'm doing is I'm passing, as I mentioned before, that we need to pass a single, in this case, I'm passing a single uh, scoring, right? So I'm passing a single uh, string, right? Of a uh, single set, right? Of one record. So if this is one customer, I'm passing the information about that customer. So my application, you know, if you have a, a phone app, right? If you have an app on the phone, an app on the web, the person is shopping something, is buying something, you're going to get that application or that specific thing running and the customer is going to request uh, that information right so immediately you need you need to get that information in real time so what's going to happen here is then i'm going to i want to see uh, you know the result from that what is the probability that this customer is going to buy my product right the guy is right there with me right on the phone or right on that screen and I want to see whether I need to show, I can show that 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 uh, offer, right? The guy is a good prospect. Uh, to also, in addition to that, I'm giving the top details. I'm passing the top end details here because I want to see why, what were the reasons why this customer, you know, we decided this customer is not a good customer, not going to buy or is going to buy, right? So uh, as an authorization here, I'm passing the token here, right? So I'm passing the token as a string there. And... Um, um, but basically that's it right so with the token in hand then i can go back to this guy and do the scoring so if i do a send here and i'm doing a post against that score then i get that uh that score right and you see the initial score is going to take some time because it's, it's you know it's going to cache the the model up uh if i send it again uh you're going to notice that now that i'm down to 136 milliseconds right and you know you keep sending you keep sending and and it's you know always keeping up around that, right? So 89 milliseconds right now as a response time. So the response time is for this customer's information. I'm saying the probability that a customer is not going to buy is very large right now is 98%, right? So very unlikely that this customer is gonna buy the product. Um, only only one and a half percent the probability the customer is gonna buy uh, that product, right? And then if you scroll down, you can see the details. So now, the reasons why this customer is not going to buy has to do with, you know, in order, bank funds, then the profession, then the gender, and then the uh, number of transactions on ATM, and the uh, money monthly overdrawn, okay? Again, this is, this is just, uh, you know, a toy, right? So you would probably would not use gender because uh, that will uh, be discrimination, right? So you, there are lots of things that you cannot use on machine learning models, right? So we're just showing you an example here. Um, one thing that uh, Postman does is that it helps you um, with visualizing that a little better. So when you look at something like this, uh, these tests, you know, if you if you take this thing and write it out uh, like that, you can then click on visualize and then you can see it like this. So much nicer to look at, you know, than the, the JSON code, for example, easier to understand. Um, so again, we see the probability there and the prediction details, right? So the weights for each of the columns, right, that, that we were looking at. Um, great. So we can do the same thing with the other model. Remember that we also deployed the SVM model, right? So if we change and put the name of that model right here, SVML, right, that was a name that we gave it. Um, if we don't use the slash score, we're going to get back the details, right, of that model. So again, we, we take the details of that model, information about that model, uh, what were the inputs that the model uses and uh, the output, right? Labels uh, out of that model, right? And if we click on visualize, uh, you're going to see the, the same details a little better, right? Easier to read. So you can scroll, you know, to the sides and see the, the links and the reference and the share, the model share, the URI and things along those lines, right? And then uh, you can see the output attributes in this model. In this particular case, it's 0, 1. And you got input attributes, right? 
and showing your, your different interport attribute types. So uh, let's try to score that model then. Uh, so for that, we're going to send the same data, right? It doesn't matter. It's the same, the same uh, input data set, the same token that I'm, uh, I've been using. And again, I'm going to go against uh, the score, right? So this time, um, this model here got me uh, a, a, an 84%. The guy is still not going to buy your product, even if you use a different model for that, right? So 84% of no, right, or of label zero. So that person is not going to buy that product. Um, details are a little different, though. And in this case, the reason why this model thought that was uh, not a person that was going to buy it is because of household size. And then the Y box games and home theater package and bookkeeping application and then years of residence, right? So uh, there might be, again, it, there will be, right? For every customer, there's a different set of reasons why they will be uh, scored, right? Um, so it depends on the on the variations on the inputs, right? Um, now, one good thing that I, that I would like to show you guys is that the um, Oracle Machine Learning models are resilient. And the Oracle Machine Learning Services, because it's running and scoring OML, models right in this case it is resilient to errors in data right so as an example you can say hey marcos you know what my application this day today is not feeling good right so i lost three of the inputs right so so now my application is only outputting you know this list of of uh, inputs instead of the whole list that the model was expecting for example well it doesn't matter right so Right now is 84% probability. Uh, if you run a sand, you're down to 83% probability. So very similar, but I'm still scoring you. Okay. So what I'm doing is on the fly, we are replacing whatever columns here that the model was expecting. We're replacing those with, you know, the average, the most frequent value, depending on the model, on the data type. Uh, because that, at least that's not interfering with your score. But we're trying to score you anyway, right? Using the rest of the data that are, you know, supposedly good, right? So that's uh, something that is a, a very nice feature to have. And even if your application adds something else, right? So if you have something that is a, a new column, right? That you decided that your application now uh, is pushing, right? So what, whatever it is, right? Whatever it is that you're sending me that is new, that is not originally in the model, it's ignored. So I, I click send and I still get scoring and I still get, you know, information back. Okay. So um, that is something that is very critical for many applications that require real time transaction and real time information there. You're going to see that that's going to be something uh, incredibly useful. Uh, another thing that uh, OML services does then, and I'm going to give you guys a quick, uh, quick uh, explanation on the left hand side here, you see several different uh, collections, right? These are Postman collections. These are all available in our GitHub. So if you guys want to explore OML services and do exactly what I was doing today, uh, you're going to be able to see those, right? So uh, I have a collection here on, on number three that uh, I was just testing out with, you know, what happens if you run uh, 10 scores, right? So if you scroll down here, I not only have one input right customer here but I have two three four right so now I'm saying okay I'm going to score 10 records uh, in one pass right so same thing I do a, a, an execution here and I got 110 milliseconds and I got 10 customers back right so again 10 probabilities right from different customers back um, and if of course if I visualize them you have customer zero and you can scroll down customer one customer two these guys are all different probabilities, right? People, some people are buying it, some people are not. And then um, you can scale all, all the way up to 250. We have, I think, 256 for now as, as a limit, but you know we can work with you guys if you have any exceptions or any specific things that you need to do. Um, we believe that this component, uh, using these REST APIs, will probably benefit from being a real-time and then we have a separate way of doing a batch scoring as well, right? That we're working on. So for this real time, then uh, I'm sending that again. And in 360 milliseconds, I got uh, 250, 
So customer zero, if I scroll all the way down, I have customer 250. So I got 251 scores that came back, right? Uh, in that, uh, in that uh, uh, speed, right? So uh, that's basically the, um, the capabilities that we bring for OML models. Now, what I was talking uh, to you guys as well is that we also have the ability to run Onyx models. So for running a classical Onyx models, just as a quick example here, I'm gonna go straight to scoring. And um, in this case, uh, I'm looking at an Onyx model. The input is a little bit different because you can see that uh, the, the type of, the way of entering the data, right? Might be a little bit different, but now I'm going against an Onyx uh, formatted model here, right? Uh, the Scikit, that was created by Scikit-Learn, uh, a Titanic pipeline, right? And um, so, and then again, I'm same thing, right? I'm going against the score of that model and I'm gonna pass the data and then I get the record, or the, the, the scoring back, right? So probability and the labels uh, out of that model. And I can also visualize them, right? So you get that, that capability here, right? So, uh, and the same thing applies for scoring multiples, right? So if I have, you know, 40 different classifications, this is how it looks like. So it's the way you need to input the, the data, right? So for all the columns, but if I, I can, again, same thing, right? I can, I'm scoring 40 different classifications here at 128 milliseconds, and I'm getting these, you know, from customer zero, if I scroll down all the way down here, I'm gonna go, um, and all the way down and find my customer number 39, right? So I have a 40 customers here that I scored. So uh, basically that's uh, part of the uh, process that I wanted to show you guys and share with you in terms of what the uh, the capabilities that we, uh, we provide, right? With uh, OML services. There are other uh, components there as well, uh, part of the cognitive text. These do not require models. These are, this is our own Wikipedia model that we uh, provide customers. Uh, we have it in English um, and uh, Spanish, in uh, French and in Italian as well. And this, this is not, uh, you know, we're, we're scoring now your text, right? So you can send a document or a, an open text like this, and then we are scoring that for you. So we run that model behind the scenes and then we say, okay, let me check what are the top, uh, you know, summaries, right, out of that text so we can, take the key summaries in English, and then we give you some uh, weights, right, for those summaries. So phrases that would summarize that text, right? So anyway, I think that's uh, part of what I wanted to show you guys and, and share with you. Uh, if um, you're interested on, on uh, some of those, I um, where to go, right? From, from, from here, I have lots of additional resources. I think Mark probably shared those resources with you guys before. Um, we have Live Labs, SQL, and Python as well. We have OML notebooks, right? We have more than 70 different uh, examples that we, we provide. And uh, the GitHub repository, right? I think is, is one important one. And the office hours as well. So um, I think I can skip these guys uh, and I just open up for uh, questions. I think we have uh, time for questions, right? Yes, uh, Marcus, thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Um, and uh, I've got two questions, one from Mr. Anonymous attendee. Um, he's saying, is there a plan to enable OML 4 Pi on traditional 19C, not ADW? I think it was said this is available on 21C only now. Uh, correct. So today it's uh, 21C only, and we are backporting it to 19C. So uh, as soon as possible, we're, we're, we're working on it. I mean, we're hoping before the end of the year it's, it's going to be available in 19C, but we can't promise uh, dates. Uh, you know, th these things um, take take some time to uh, to get okay, right, and vetted. But we are porting that uh, to 19C, yes, for on premises. Thank you. Uh, and then Michael Juarez um, says, are these OML features available in the ADW that is deployed with FAW? Sorry for the alphabet soup, he says. <laughs> Um, as long as it's an autonomous database shared, then it would, it, all these features are available. If you have an autonomous database, a dedicated infrastructure, then, um, there's a difference because then the, there, these apps 
are not available there. So the components are, I mean, the components that I mean is the language, right? And the capability of building models is there. You would just need to go and build them in SQL, right? by yourself using a different tool, right? You would not have the OML notebooks if it's not an autonomous database shared infrastructure, if okay. that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, I think it does. All right, and that, that, that is all of the questions. So yeah, if anyone does have further questions that they think of, of course, you're welcome to get hold of um, Marcos directly. Um, and he's, you can see his contact details on the screen right now. And uh, this um, recording, of course, will be posted um, in our tech ar uh, TechCast's archive and on YouTube in the coming weeks. So with that, thank you very much, Marcus, for your uh, participation and for your contribution. Much thank appreciated. You. Okay.